All righty, I hope you can all hear me. A warm welcome, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to all of you. Actually, today um, heralds the resumption of a uh, tradition that was uh, started in 2007 uh, by one of our uh, former directors of, uh, of our MENA department at the uh, Dutch MFA. And at that time, these, uh, this uh, lecture, this public lecture that we're also going to experience tonight was called uh, Dam uh, naar Buiten, which sort of translates as to Dam which is the name and acronym for our MENA department at, the, at our MFA, DUM opening its doors to the outside world. Um, this, uh, this series of lectures uh, was started by um, uh, our former director, one of our former directors, Henriette van Linden, and uh, hence the name of the Henriette van Linden uh, lectures. And after Henriette's passing in uh, 20, uh, 2010, uh, the lecture um, has, uh, has bared her name uh, ever since. Um, we have, uh, we've had in the past quite some, uh, quite some well-renowned speakers, uh, Shirin Rabadi, Shirin Abadi, one the, um, the Iranian uh, um, uh, Nobel uh, Human uh, Rights Prize laureate, uh, was, was one of them. Um, Caroline Roulans, uh, the NRC, which is the Dutch newspaper uh, journalist, and also uh, Lina Khatib, the uh, MENA director of uh, the, uh, currently the MENA director of the, uh, the Chatham House. Um, we, uh, we know that um, also tonight we have a, a very distinguished, uh, a very distinguished uh, speaker. We're very happy that he's here. I will say a few words on him uh, uh, later on, but I would also like to uh, uh, say a few words on, on the Henriette van Linde lectures as such. Um, actually, Henriette started this to draw attention, uh, to shed light on, on, a, on, a, on a region which is, very close, which is very close to the European Union and um, also to uh, attract public attention, uh, not only you know, from uh, professionals who are, who are working on the MENA on, on a daily basis, but also for a more, for a more general, general audience. Um, so that was, that was to, to draw public attention, to stimulate debate, to stimulate debate and foster, foster mutual understanding uh, between people in Europe and the Netherlands and in the MENA region, of course. Um, tonight, after... Um, uh, after having uh, so many distinguished speakers, of course, we had to we had to look for for, for someone else who could match the uh, our, our previous uh, our previous speakers. And I think we uh, we have found uh, we have found someone, um, and he is sitting over there. Um, he will he will entertain us tonight. His uh, his name is Dr. Uh, Dr. Amar Hamzawi. Uh, Dr. Hamzawi um, was um, was educated in uh, in Egypt, in uh, Germany, and in the ne in the Netherlands actually at the Institute for Social Studies. Um, and I, uh, I understood that he also spent uh, quite some time here at, uh, at Leiden University. Um, um, he has extensive uh, teaching, teaching experience. Um, for the past few years, he taught at uh, Stanford University. And very soon, he will switch to uh, George Washington, George Washington University. He's also affiliated with the, um, with the, Carnegie, with the Carnegie Endowment. Um, and his academic research and, teaching, and teachings mainly revolve around uh, democrat, democrat, democratization processes and uh, governance in the Arab world. Uh, yesterday, yesterday, we had a very um, interesting, fascinating workshop with a, uh, with a number of uh, graduate students, uh, not only from Lady University, but from other universities here in the Netherlands as well. Um, I think that um, they all enjoyed it. They learned a lot. Uh, we, were, we were also there. Um, actually, I, I learned uh, quite a lot myself as well. Um, Amr also uh, did an interview with, um, with uh, Trau, a Dutch newspaper. Perhaps you've already seen it. If uh, not, uh, have a look at it. Also very nice. Um, what we'll do tonight is um, Amr will give a, uh, will give a lecture then after that, we'll, we'll do some Q&A because we want to make this an, an interactive, an interactive uh, session. Uh, and after that, we'll, we'll have a reception with, uh, with a few drinks and a few bites. Um, before giving the floor to Amr, I would like to give the floor to uh, my colleague, Bauke Dijks. And by the way, I think I forgot to introduce myself. My name is John van der Zonde. I'm a strategic policy advisor at the MENA department at the, uh, at the MFA in The Hague. And my colleague, uh, Bauke Dijkstra, will say a few words on the uh, Shiraka program, because this year's lecture, um, this year's Henriette van Linde lecture, will also take place within the framework of the 10-year anniversary 
of the Shiraka program. Bauke, the floor is yours. Well, uh, the Shiraka program uh, was established 10 years ago at the request of the Dutch Parliament. The program is focusing on the relationship between citizens and government systems in the MENA region. We are focusing on three main topics, rule of law, good governance, and the uh, circumstances for sustainable economic development. For example, projects which are focusing on creating employment for youth and women. Um, well, that's actually a short pitch. If you want to know more about the Shiraka program, have a look on our uh, online um, website. And for questions, uh, you're most welcome to have a chat uh, during the reception. Anna, I would like to give the word to you. Have a nice evening. Good evening. Thank you so much, John and Bauke, for a um, very kind introduction. Thank you so much for coming to the lecture. I know for students especially, it's your last, uh, one of your last uh, weeks. So you must be uh, fighting against deadlines. And um, so I can, I can relate. My oldest son um, is in New York in his second semester. He's studying creative writing and sonic arts, which is the more modern label for music management industry and so on and so forth. And he is in his finals and quite pressed with time to the extent that he hasn't been responding to my phone calls or text messages since, I would say, four days. So, um, uh, so I do sympathize, and I'm grateful for um, uh, those of you who found time to come. Uh, I'm also very, very grateful for having had the opportunity of discussing with some of you, some of the um, very bright graduate students of the University of Leiden and elsewhere from different departments yesterday where we did have a workshop on, John was referring to it, on popular mobilizations and democratic breakthroughs. And so we, um, uh, I was quite impressed by the fact that some, at least, of the participants did read the assigned readings, which is always a great uh, sign for, uh, for an instructor. And it was, it was a lively and well-informed discussion. So I was grateful to have some exchange uh, with graduate students of Leiden and elsewhere. Um, I'm also grateful for my colleagues, scholars who are attending, for um, um, friends from the foreign ministry, as well as for uh, different Arab ambassadors um, and from Middle Eastern embassies who found their way to the lecture. I'm grateful for your um, uh, time and for your interest in the lecture. I couldn't but take note of the student who came in and was basically in search for a different lecture. And um, I was just going to tell Bauke, keep him. Please do not let him go. Uh, so, but this is sort of my first point. When I, um, and let me, let me, let me um, um, just share one more initial remark before I start with my first point, which is we're speaking about the Middle East, about the Arab world, 10 years, a decade after the democratic uprisings of 2011, in a moment in which the Middle East internationally does not garner the same attention it garnered in 2011, 12, or even a couple of years ago. So the starting point is, and for me, the student who came in and then went out can be used as a symbol for the fact that this region has lost, has lost its, its uh, appeal uh, to an extent it has been classified as a region full of crises, social, economic, and political crises. States are disintegrating in some places, civil wars in other places. There is not much of good press for the Middle East uh, throughout the last years, and the result when you compare um, the Middle East to more relevant regions in world politics, Europe with the Russian war on Ukraine, or global crises like the energy crisis or climate change, the Middle East and its value in global discussions has been changing drastically in recent years. And we really have to, to pause and, and, and realize that this is no longer the same level of attention 
which used to be given to the region right after um, uh, 2011. Um, it's no longer the same level of attention by policymakers or by um, uh, the word um, media landscapes, uh, by opinion makers. It's no longer the same interest which used to be given to the Middle East right after 2011. And to my mind, um, it's, it's, it's a factor of different uh, realities that I would like to start my first point by reflecting on. The first one is, and I'm conscious of the fact that this is a public lecture, so I'm not going to, to uh, frame my arguments in an, in an academic way. I will frame it more as a, a public intellectual. So the first, the first reality leading to the loss of interest in the Middle East is the fact that there has not been positive change in the region throughout the last 10 years. The decade started very hopefully with citizens taking to the street and putting forward a set of demands which were very clear. Some demands were geared toward creating and installing responsive governments. And with responsive governments, um, some additional demands for rule of law, protection of rights and freedoms went along. The calls for responsive government and rule of law were heard in Tunisia, in Egypt, but also in the beginning in Libya, Syria, and Yemen, in Bahrain, and, and, and elsewhere. But that was one set of demands. The second set of demands were geared to address social and economic issues. These were not uprisings only driven by political um, uh, demands. These were not uprisings only driven by uh, rights and freedoms. They were also driven by improving social and economic conditions. The living conditions of majorities in the region, in the Middle East, were um, uh, facing different um, uh, impasses, uh, poverty, unemployment, um, a widening gap between rich and poor. I will share the numbers um, uh, and figures in a moment. But the decade started in a very hopeful way by citizens taking to the street in a nonviolent manner, demanding political reform, demanding responsive governments, demanding social and economic uh, reforms to improve their living conditions. And when you look at the countries in which the uprisings happened, all the way from Tunisia to Egypt to Syria to Yemen to Libya, if you just sort of close your eyes in 2011 and 2012 and open your eyes again in 2022, you will not be able to find improvements with regard to uh, responsive governments. You will not be able to find improvements with regard to social and economic conditions in a manner which would say here is a region that has embarked on the way uh, of progress and moving forward. So the first point I'm trying to make is that the story of the last decade, if you take it in a macro uh, perspective, is a story of lack of uh, progress in the region. And that has turned the word attention to an extent away from the region. No one likes a bad story the whole time. No one likes to read the same news about civil wars, about uh, disintegration of state institutions, about violent and terrorist attacks and so on and so forth. But the second reality which led to the word attention moving away from the Middle East is pretty much related to, to the fact that the initial images of the democratic uprisings of 2011, which were later to happen again in 2018 and 2019 in a different set of countries. I mean, the first wave happened in Tunisia, Egypt, Syria, Libya, uh, and Yemen and to an extent in Bahrain, second wave in 2018 and 2019 um, comprised primarily four countries, two in Africa, in the African uh, part of the Arab world, and two in the Asian part, Algeria, Sudan, Lebanon, and Iraq. In the two waves, the initial pictures of citizens calling nonviolently for political reform, for social and economic reforms, were soon followed by pictures of societies in violent confrontations. We woke up 
in, in, in Tunisia and Egypt to a massive rise of religious, some of which were violent movements, religious movements, some of which were nonviolent and some of which were violent and called for violence and did not shy away from using violence for political purposes. We woke up to different images of sectarian um, uh, clashes happening. When you look at the second wave of the uprisings in Lebanon and Iraq and you compare the initial images of the first days with what followed, you clearly see a shift from civilians calling for nonviolence, for calling for um, side sidelining religion and sectarian identities from politics and the public space to images in which religion was once again in a, in a violent manner being injected into politics and the public space and sectarian identities as well. So the second, the second reality I'm referring to is that we all woke up to social fabrics which were very complex. These were not only social fabric that were geared to demand um, uh, nonviolent, peaceful, economic, social, and political reform. We woke up to social fabrics which turned out um, uh, to be quite um, um, uh, in, in trouble in terms of not settling um, the big debates which any society has to settle. What is the role of religion in the public space and in politics? How can we relate um, a civilian order, a constitutional order, to um, uh, an extensive use of religion in politics? How can we sort out uh, politics away from sectarianism on the one hand and violence on the other hand? The third reality which led to that initial euphoric response to 2011 or the second wave of 2018 and 2019, and I'm including myself in the euphoric response, the third factor which moved us away from this euphoric response into more of a um, reality check and really sort of looking at what is happening in the region um, has, been, has been the fact that we were faced with the very challenging phenomenon of state disintegration, nation state disintegration in different places in the region. And when I, when I look at Syria, when I look at Libya, or when I look at Yemen, these are three societies in the region which are challenged with state fragmentation, state disintegration, under different conditions for different reasons, and I'm not generalizing between the three, but the region overall was seeing state institutions, nation states disintegrating, fragmenting, creating vacuums of security, vacuums of, um, uh, vacuums of insecurity, I have to say, creating safe havens for the emergence of radical and terrorist violent groups. So the first positive images of masses taking to the streets and demanding peacefully in a, not only in a, in a, in a I would say, in a, in a manner guided by principles of liberal democracy uh, to a great extent, demanding incremental reform, demanding change to create responsive governments, rule of law, economic and social improvement, better share for the poor and the impoverished and the marginalized in um, uh, the respective national resources. These images were soon to be followed by the images which more, more um, troubled social fabrics created. Um, troubled around religion, troubled around the question of violence, troubled around the question of sectarianism and sectarian identities, and so on and so forth. So the last, the last 10 years, when you reflect, when I reflect on them, are sobering to an, to, to in, in the sense of understanding that it is destined not to be easy to find entry points or ways to reform the Arab world, the MENA region, socially, economically, and politically. It's destined to be a um, long-term issue. It's destined to be not a linear evolution, but a very problematic, complex process, which definitely is bound to be cyclical. Some steps forward and steps backward, and we're destined to see troubling phenomena emerging all the way from state disintegration to violent extremism to 
loss, even uh, deterioration of civil key civil rights and freedoms. I mean, when you look at Tunisia as of now in 2022 and you compare um, from a gender equality perspective where Tunisia was before 2011 and where Tunisia is as of now, I mean, this is a net regression, which you can, you can find in, in the Tunisian case. But this is sort of the first big point I would like to, 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 to make, um, sort of the reality check that we have all been going through in the last 10 years. Second point, am I, am I saying that the demand for democratic change uh, was misguided? Of course not. It's not I'm, what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that the demand for democratic change needs to be repackaged, and it's being repackaged in different Middle Eastern countries and societies in a way which does take into account the difficult social, economic, and political realities on the ground. And in a way, this repackaging is a, a process of awareness, which we have been all going through in the region. So when I look at the last 10 years, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying that the region pushed away those who are interested in its fate because of the bad press it's been having and the different crises and problems it's been suffering from. But for us in the region, the journey of the last 10 years has been a very educational journey. I mean, uh, it came at a high cost. It came at a horrendous cost in some places like Syria, Libya, Yemen, uh, even in Sudan where the ongoing contestation between different participants in politics and in the public space is being continued and not at no cost, it's at, at, at a human cost, at a political cost and at a social and economic cost, or in places where the cost has been um, uh, quite limited uh, to an extent where state disintegration has not been unfolding, this journey has been educational for all of us. And so here, I would like to stop and, and sort of take stock of what we learned. I mean, what I personally learned as someone who has been observing Arab politics, the MENA region throughout the last years and before 2011, to an extent participated in politics briefly, and then went back to my academic um, uh, place and my public intellectual hat and um, uh, continued to observe. To my mind, there are five big takeaways from the journey of the MENA region between 2011 and 2022, where we are right now. The first takeaway is, I would, I would frame it in a, in a sort of provocative manner so that we can discuss later on. The first big takeaway to my mind is the fact that the only way forward to introduce democratic reform, to introduce social and economic reform, to improve governance, to figure out a place for religion and religious identities and sectarian identities in the social fabric, which in a way which does not undermine democracy, and this can only be a secular framework of sorts, that the only way forward is to push for incremental change, not radical, not sudden change. So if you would like to frame it in a more sort of press-styled way, this region, the MENA region, is not a region for regime change. It's a region for gradual reform. It's a region for, in fact, gradual reform, which will have to include members, groups, segments of the current ruling establishments and of opposition groups, secular opposition groups, nonviolent opposition groups, as well as civil society organizations. In a way, what I am trying to get at is an image similar to how most Latin American countries democratized in the 1980s and 1990s. In political science, we refer to um, um, the literature on pacted transitions, and those pacted transitions were transitions where members of uh, incumbent regimes 
uh, in most cases, reform-oriented elements in incumbent regimes opened up um, a political dialogue in which they included opposition and civil society uh, groups and tried to figure out a new arrangement, gradual arrangement of politics. If you wish, it happened before Latin America in the southern part of Europe, which democratized in the 1970s in Greece and Spain and in Portugal, away from autocratic governments and into democratic governments. The first big takeaway from the journey of the region in the last 10 and 11 years is that this is not a region for sudden uh, change, for radical change, for uh, regime change, for hosting successfully, hosting uh, incumbent presidents and leading uh, the way of democratization. This is a region for gradual reform, for incremental reform, which has to happen, taking into account the power relations uh, on the ground, and in most countries, incumbent regimes are strong, even when they face shocks like uprisings. And look at Sudan, for example. Sudan, the uprising happened in 2019, a uh, democratic, nonviolent uprising faced with violence from the incumbent regime. Fast forward, almost three, more than three years forward, the contestation is still happening on the ground, and the only way forward is for the two big groups to sit down and find a compromise. This is takeaway number one. The second big takeaway is that the danger we're facing in the region is not only the danger of autocratic and, 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 and Paul, where is Paul? Here's Paul. We were discussing yesterday the question of autocratic resilience. The danger in, in, in the Middle East and North Africa is not only the danger of the resilience of existing reform, unfriendly, uh, we label them authoritarian, we label them autocratic or undemocratic regime. The danger is as well, I mean, the, the fact, the resilience uh, of existing regimes is a fact, in, in some places at least. But the parallel danger is the fact that once you try to shake these existing regimes, you're not only shaking the political system as such, you're shaking the very nation state, which has been penetrated for several decades, and of course historians are more um, uh, capable of reading how these processes unfolded on the ground in the post-independence Arab world, in the post-independence Middle East and North Africa, but when you, when you shake these regimes, you threaten, in fact, to shake the very existence of the respective nation state. And we have had the opportunity as observers, scholars, public intellectuals, journalists, to collect enough empirical evidence for exactly this, for the danger of uh, shaking the nation state, fragmenting, leading to the fragmentation of the nation state in Libya, in, 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 in Yemen, in Syria, and in other places, the question of the state monopoly over the use of power, over the legitimate use of power, was being questioned as well. I mean, look at how many uh, violent um, uh, attacks, violent terrorist attacks happened in Egypt. Look at how many jihadists uh, went from Tunisia to Syria and elsewhere. The monopoly of the state the, the monopoly of the state over the legitimate use of power, over the use of power for public order, um, has been threatened. So the second big takeaway is the fact that we have to keep in mind that when we are shaking regimes in context of uh, popular demands for change, for uh, reforms, for democracy, for rotation of power, that we are always have to have our eyes on what will happen to the respective nation state and to the social fabrics over which the respective nation state preside. Of course, you can always say, well, in Syria, the nation state was shaken when Syrians, some Syrians took to the street to demand uh, democracy because this very nation state has been repressive, has been um, uh, suppressing diversity, ethnic diversity, um, religious diversity, has been uh, based on a minority rule. I mean, you, 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 you can list a great deal of factors for why the state and its existence became threatened when the Syrian popular uprising uh, was happening. 
But the fact of the matter is that this is the his political history of this country, and if you are trying to figure out a way to reform politically, socially, and economically without destroying the patterns, existing patterns of state society relations, you have to take into account the danger of state disintegration. It's not only about shaking um, uh, or, or, or um, uh, challenging uh, incumbent regimes, it's about the nation state as well. The third big takeaway is that the very idea of democratic change is based, and I'm always reminded of a great book, uh, an Arabic language book, which a Lebanese political scientist and uh, former official and the UN former official by the name of Ghassan Salama uh, put out um, under the title of Democracy Without Democrats, Demokratia Bedun Demokrati, which was a reflection back in the first decade of the new millennium uh, on political reforms, gradual political reforms which were happening in different Arab places, in Jordan, in Morocco, in Egypt, we were seeing back then the creation of what we term in political science semi-autocratic or semi-authoritarian regimes, sort of autocratic regimes which create different spaces for a bit of political contestation in elections, for parliaments, or um, in, in, in professional associations and in trade unions, sometimes in sports clubs, what have you. A, a bit of political contestation was unfolding. And, uh, and some legal reforms were happening as well, some of which were empowering um, uh, women, creating uh, better spaces for gender equality in the public space as well as in the private um, uh, space, space of family and individual uh, relationships. And some, some were, 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 were in fact liberalizing media landscapes and creating an, an aura of pluralism. Back, back in the first decade of the new millennium, when Ghassan Salama edited his volume I was just referring to, Democracy Without Democrats, he identified as a major problem of, an, a major obstacle of democratization in the Arab world, the fact that we do not have, away from incumbent regimes, that we do not have democratic movements on the ground. We do not have democratically spirited movements on the ground. He said, when I look, and they, they examine eight case studies in North Africa and in the Levant and in the Gulf. And he said, when I, when, I, when I look away from regimes, when I look away from governments, what I'm seeing are undemocratic forces. I'm seeing forces which use religion in politics in an unrestricted fashion. I am seeing uh, movements and groups and parties which confuse religious uh, identities with political preferences where they try to create political capital based on the use of religion and based on using religious spaces and for they were referring to modern religious movements which were on the rise in the region since the 1970s, end of the 1960s, beginning of the 1970s. But he was also in his group, his group of, of uh, political scientists and sociologists was referring as well to the fact that nominally liberal and leftist uh, movements and parties in the Arab world do have great limitations when it comes to their democratic platforms, even internally. And a very, one of the very interesting uh, chapters in the book was comparing the question of succession between governments and regimes and opposition political parties, coming to the answer that if rotation of power and peaceful succession is not happening in an incumbent regime, it was also not happening in liberal and leftist political parties. They were not rotating power. They had forever presidents. I, I, was, I, have, I, have, I have to stop and tell you because, I mean, sometimes uh, German helps to understand some of the signs I read around me. And so when I went yesterday to the building of the Faculty of Social Science to give my, my, my workshop, on my way back, I, I passed by a cafe by the name of Der Ewige Student. I'm pronouncing it in German. And Der Ewige Student. So what we had in, in Arab liberal and leftist parties were the Ewigen Präsidenten in German. So 
it was, it was as exactly as the incumbent regimes, no difference. So it was not only the fact that we, we had the, the very problematic, unsorted, unaccounted for, normatively, socially, politically, the unstoppable rise of religious movements which were confusing religion and politics, undermining existing sec secular legal frameworks which dated back in some places like Egypt or in, in Syria or in, 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 in Tunisia to the 19th, and Iraq to the 1920s and 1930s, but we also had undemocratically spirited leaders and elites in the opposition spectrum. The third point on, on the question of democracy without Democrats was related to the fact that what was pushed forward, in fact, and not only for the Middle East, but worldwide as sort of the panacea, sort of a, the magical solution for the question of democratization, civil society. I mean, you remember, uh, and any, any student of political science uh, will know that the literature on civil society emerged right after the transition in Eastern and Central Europe, 1989, 1990. In the first half of the 1990s, we were seeing uh, edited volumes, monographies on civil society, covering civil society organizations across the globe. I edited a book on civil society in the Arab world in 1995. And the same happened in, in political science literature elsewhere. What seemed to be um, suggested by all of us back then, that if we are having difficulties finding incumbent regimes willing to reform, where we have reform-minded or soft-liners uh, or democracy-friendly groups within incumbent regimes to open up, to create political opening, and to move from political opening into a process of democratization, later to consolidate democracy. I mean, you know, we have this literature on transitology in political science where we have democratic opening, uh, the democratization, consolidation of democracy as outlined uh, processes and phases. If the problem is with incumbent regimes and liberal and leftist opposition or religious groups and movements, all of those do not have enough democratic credentials. It's civil society which will bring in that missing democratic component in the Arab polity or in the Arab public, uh, public space. And in the same book, and I, I, I really can, can only attest to how brilliant the book is and continues to bear great relevance uh, for the region and for explaining its politics 20 years later than its publication date, even when you, when you look at civil society, we, they were seeing, and later I came to see in the countries which I've been working on, the same deficiencies, the same structural deficiencies, which could um, uh, be found in relation to incumbent regimes and uh, political parties were found in civil societies as well. And add to them one additional structural deficiency, which after 2011 came to be of great significance. The disparity between urban and rural areas. The fact we woke up after 2011, by the way, to find in the countries which were uh, becoming dynamic in the sense of using the street and public arenas for democratic demands or demands for political, social, and economic change. We were seeing most of the dynamism unfold in urban places. Rural areas were relegated to unaccounted for uninterested in regions, although in most Arab countries, majorities live in rural areas, not in urban places. I remember looking at the election participation in Egypt in the various elections we had between 2011 and 2013, and over 60% of the voting segment of the Egyptian electorate was in rural areas, was not in urban places, but no one paid attention. The dynamism of the street, of the square, of the public arena was an urban dynamism in which rural areas were completely pushed aside. And this same structural imbalance between urban and rural areas is enshrined in civil society organizations, most of which across the region operate in urban places, do not reach out to rural areas. So if we're talking seriously about enfranchising, not disenfranchising segments of the population, bringing them in, inclusion as a key benchmark for responsive governments, for reform, for change, this was a problem with civil society organizations as well. 
So th the second big takeaway I'm trying to refer to is the fact that while we woke up to, to the reality of the intertwined existence of incumbent regimes, existing political systems, and nation state structures, and the difficulty of keeping the structural framework for the respective nation state, keeping it stable while regimes are being threatened or shocked by popular uprisings or by any other shock, exogenous shock, external shock from outside the regime, that this was very much related to the fact that when that bit of opening was happening, we were not only threatened by the disintegration of the nation state, we were also waking up to a polity or a public space which was not populated by democratic forces. And if you look at the results of any election in the Arab world, in the Middle East and North Africa, after 2011, you clearly see that majorities in the ballot box were won by undemocratic forces. I mean, you can, of course, say that I'm using a normative definition of what democracy is or what democratic is, and yes, I do. I do not see the question of democracy to be simply a procedural question. I am not ignoring the importance of procedures, and I will not go in the direction which some um, uh, Middle Eastern uh, intellectuals and writers have actually pushed forward in the sense of it's not about the procedural democracy, it's about what we believe to be the right mix of values and value systems and freedom of opinion and protection of uh, freedom of expression and freedom of association, even if the ballot box is turning uh, the opposite results. No, I'm saying we have to include what the ballot box tells us, what kind of majorities it establishes, but democracy and democratic transition cannot be only about the ballot box and the procedural majority which is established in it. And we saw the outcome in, 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 in Egypt, we saw it in, in Tunisia, and we continue to see it in a place like Iraq where we do have um, pluralist political landscape which is permeated and dominated by sectarian, uh, affiliated and sectarian operated uh, I'm sorry, sectarian operating groups presiding over a decaying and dysfunctional nation state and set of political institutions. So in, in a way it's important to keep in mind that it's not, it's not only a procedural, it's about what kind of normative preferences are established in politics, in polities, or in the political contestation unfolding on the ground. But this is sort of the second takeaway. The third takeaway from, from the last 10 years is, if I'm saying the primacy of the nation state, the primacy of gradual reform, the primacy of bringing together a procedural and a normative understanding of democratic change, and not only the, being dependent on the ballot box. The third takeaway is the primacy of the economy in moments of transition. And that's, to my mind, the biggest lesson we're learning right now in Tunisia, and we learned elsewhere in the region throughout the last 10 years. That you cannot afford, after successful popular mobilization, successful in the sense of the popular mobilization wave in Tunisia defined as its objective the removal of former President Ben Ali. He was removed. So in a way, if you, if, you, if you would like to have a clear benchmark to assess the success of the popular mobilization, it was the removal of the incumbent regime, or the president. He was removed. But the success was not going to be complete unless this removal would lead the way of Tunisians into the establishment of a democratic order which accounts for the demands that were chanted on, on the streets in Tunis and elsewhere, political, social, and economic demands. And these demands were not accounted for, especially the social and economic demands. Tunisians saw their key economic mac macro and microeconomic indicators worsen in the last 10 years. Unemployment rate higher than it was pre-2011. Poverty rate higher than it was pre-2011. Widening gap between rich and poor 
more, more deeper than it was prior to 2011. Growing corruption, even if you leave aside social and economic demands and look at the structure and the, the sort of structured features of the public space, growing radicalization, growing um, uh, militarization in, in, uh, within religious-based groups, and so on and so forth. Very worrying symptoms. But for, for, for Tunisians which took to the, who took to the street to demand change, the economy was key. Social reforms were key. And because they were not, you see, I mean, my point is proven. One, one more who, who shied away from uh, discussion on the Middle East. So Tunisians, Tunisians were, 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 their demands were not met and, and they were increasingly losing their trust and their buy-in with regard to the democratic process. So what has been happening in Tunisia in the last two years is not simply a an undemocratically spirited president taking over. This is a very reduced understanding of what's happening. What has been happening in Tunisia is the fact that masses, majorities, and in fact it was, to an extent, this reality was established in the ballot box in the last elections, lost their faith in the democratic transition, in the process itself. They waited, were patient for several years, their life was deteriorating, they continued to have their buy-in, and then they decided, no, this is not the way forward. We're not getting what we demanded. We're not getting the responsive government because this government is not uh, attending to our social and economic needs. And when you look away from the countries which went through waves of uprisings to countries which were not impacted by the first or second wave of the uprisings, Jordan, Morocco, for example. The difference between the two countries is when compared to the country that did witness popular uprisings and political contestation unfolding on the ground, the fact that the difference is that the governments in the two countries worked to improve with varying degrees of success in Morocco higher than in Jordan to improve the economic and social conditions, living conditions on the ground. And the result is when you look at Morocco, by the way, Morocco had in the last two years the highest uh, GDP growth rate in the Middle East and North Africa. Morocco has, with Egypt, in fact, Egypt to a slight extent, but Morocco more significant, has reduced poverty by 3% in 2020 and 2021, including during um, uh, the pandemic. Unemployment rates has been going, uh, the unemployment rate has been going down, the poverty rate has been going down, economic um, uh, GDP uh, growth rate has been the highest, around 7% in 2020 and 2021. So here you see a government which learned the lesson of the primacy, the centrality of the economy and of social uh, change, improvements in living conditions, and delivered to an extent. Morocco witnessed only one set of demonstrations in a specific region, the Reef region, and, it, and, and this was a reflection of ignoring this specific region from a social and economic perspective for a long time. The protest activities or protests happen, the government is starting to pay attention to it, and of course, I'm not only saying that they are only paying attention socially and economically, they are using some policing tools as well. But here is a government which is taking the economy seriously in a, in a, in a, in a, in a different place in, um, in Algeria prior to and after the uprising of 2018 and 2019. The government in Algeria before 2018 and 19 uh, was presiding over deteriorating employment uh, rates, deteriorating poverty rates. In fact, some public opinion surveys, and I was sharing it with the participants of the workshop yesterday, testified to the fact that the majority of Algerian, young Algerians had only one dream, not to change their faith in their country, but to escape their country. I mean, according to the Arab barometer, the number one demand was to leave. After the uprising, the, con the government of the current president started to extend social safety networks to re-engage as a big investor in the public sector to employ people, and the result is the fact that the unemployment rate has been going down by 6% to now 127 down from 
17 point eight percent in 2019 now it's 12 point seven in 2021 and the poverty rate has been going down from eight percent to five point five percent one of the lowest in, in in the region so the primacy of the economy while you're transitioning to a democratic order is the third big takeaway the fourth before last big takeaway from the last 10 years is, in fact, very much related to the question of value systems, of culture, and of the big debates which have not been settled in the Arab world or in the Arab part of the Middle East and North Africa since the beginnings of the 20th century or the late um, uh, 19th century. And I'm, ref I'm referring to debates about the role of religion, primarily the role of religion in the public space and politics. What to do with religion in, in the public space and in politics? What kind of a legal framework? Is it a legal framework based on the principles of uh, Islamic law, or is it a legal framework based on uh, modern law, the codification of modern law, or is Sharia uh, the source of legislation and what should uh, be codified? So the place of religion in the legal framework, in the constitution, and in the legal framework, the place of religion in the public space, is it a force defining what gets said in the public space? Does it define the practice of freedom of association and freedom of expression? Does religion restrict freedom of association or freedom of expression? And the place of religion, even when it comes to religious sanctioned spaces, are they sanctioned by one interpretation of religion? Are they sanctioned by one dominant religious group? Or in social fabrics where we have a plurality of social, of religious groups, what do we do? Do we have religious spaces sanctioned by religious majorities and religious minorities? Or do we have majorities silencing minorities and, 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 and um, uh, sidelining their rights and freedoms? These debates have been in discussion in the region since the 19th century, the late 19th century, and throughout the 20th century up until today, and they have not been settled. And attempts to settle them after the democratic or popular uprisings of 2011, in fact, backfired, led in some places, like Tunisia, to regression, or led to no uh, positive change, as in Egypt. And I remember right after 2011, when in, in Egypt, a constituent assembly was elected to draft a new constitution. Uh, it was elected out of uh, the uh, parliament, and I, I was back then elected to parliament and elected to the constituent assembly. And I remember raising the discussion around the second article of the Egyptian constitution, which stipulates that the principles of Sharia uh, are the prime source of legislation. And I said that this too needs to be discussed. If we are drafting a new constitution, there are no taboos, and the question pertaining to the principles of Sharia as the prime source of legislation needs to be looked at. And I can only uh, testify to how all hell broke loose, personally as well, and how the constituent assembly in which I was member was um, uh, basically turned dysfunctional by many secular figures, including myself, resigning in face of a uh, stronghold and strong control by religious groups which were not only satisfied with the reference to the principles of Sharia as a primary source of legislation, actually wanted to codify Sharia in the constitution. In Tunisia, although the question of religion was responded to in the constitution in a more progressive manner, referring to it in a pluralist way and not as the prime source of legislation, and in fact stating that the state uh, does not, I mean, they did not state that the state has a religion. However, in reality, in the political contestation, Tunisia's polity and Tunisia's legal framework was being turned away from the secular legacy of the post-independence era. 
after 2011. But these debates about religion, religious identities, majorities, minorities, and the related set of questions uh, on sectarianism and sectarian identities have not been settled in the region. And unless these social fabrics are able to settle them, be it in political contestation or in the context of uh, pluralist debate, it's very, very difficult for me to imagine a successful democratic transition in any country where the place of religion is not clarified or where the question of religious and sectarian identities um, or majority-minority relationships uh, has not been dealt with. The final takeaway is the fact that we in the Middle East should not place our bets on the role of external actors. And I believe this is one of the big lessons of the last 10 years as well. And I'm not saying that most actors, political actors in the region, be it, I'm referring to incumbent regimes or opposition groups or civil societies, placed their bet on external actors, but there was a bit of sort of I believe in, 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 in the collective understanding of political groups, especially in a place like Tunisia, maybe to a lesser extent Egypt, but maybe in a place like Lebanon among some groups. This constant appeal to the role of external actors as if they would be substantially interested in working it out in a long-term fashion, that if we place our bet on the pro-democracy or pro-reform uh, or pro-stability or pro-progress role of the West, um, the United States, Europe, the international community, that we wouldn't go wrong. And I, I believe one, the last big lesson from the last 10 years is the fact that the West and the international community are not eternally interested in the Middle East. We are not that important. There are so many more important regions, even with the significant strategic significance we have due to energy and due to um, the geostrategic uh, location of the Middle East, we're not the only region which matters. In fact, when you look at debates within the policy community in the US, before the Russian war on Ukraine, the talk of town in Washington DC was among the Democratic Party within the Biden administration, but also to an extent within the Republican Party, was the need to move the U.S. out of the Middle East, not only out of Afghanistan. I mean, the way the, way the U.S. and the European partners uh, left Afghanistan and, and the, the horrific reality which, was, uh, which we woke up to. Uh, not only the uh, horrific reality which came by due to, to, to the withdrawal, but the horrific reality which was still in the making on the ground in Afghanistan. It was not only about pushing, pulling the U.S. Uh, out of Afghanistan or pushing it away from, 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 from it, but pushing it away from the Middle East. The pivot to Asia, pivot away from the Middle East. It's only in the context of the Russian war in Ukraine and the growing significance of energy once again that the U.S. is trying to reinsert itself uh, politically, geostrategically, from a security perspective in the Middle East. But once again, it will take an energy transition, and there are growing discussions about energy transitions uh, day in, day out, especially in, in increasingly. Uh, intense debates in the West about energy transition and it would be irrational on the side of citizens but as well as on the side of governments and political actors in the MENA region to be blinded away and not to reflect on how the upcoming energy transition will change the, the geostrategic importance of the Middle East and North Africa. It will not remain this significant region uh, for a very long time. And even with the current energy realities, it's not the only region which matters. And the West can look away. But more, more, more important from a reform perspective, the fact that promoting reform does collide 
with key strategic interests of different Western governments as well. And this is the story of the last 10 years. Sometimes you're faced with, uh, as a policymaker in a Western capital, you're faced with a very tough choice between promoting uh, liberal democratic ideals and values and processes and between protecting your strategic interests. And there are, uh, there are different patterns of collision between short-term interests and long-term interests. And keep in mind that democratic governments are always held accountable for four years, for one cycle. So what really matters is not what will happen in 10 years from now, but what will happen in the next four years, in the four years in the parliamentary cycle. And this is even more drastic in the U.S. as opposed to, to Europe. I mean, the cycle, the political cycle in the U.S. really operates based on the term, the presidential term. It's about the four years. And so these collisions do exist, and any real uh, politic uh, interpretation has to take into account the fact that strategic interests of the West do collide sometimes with, with, with political reform, social and economic reform, with maybe the inclusion of uh, some segments of the population. So the la last takeaway from the last decade is the fact that we cannot, in the region, place our bet on the role, on the pro-democracy role of external actors. We are in a specific region in which the international environment has not been conducive in a linear sense, has not been unilaterally or in a linear sense conducive for democratic change or for social and economic change that is meant to include uh, the poor, the needy, the impoverished uh, section of the population. To an extent, it happened in some places, in other places it did not. When you compare, for example, Tunisia on the one hand, to Egypt, Lebanon, and Syria on the other hand, the geographic proximity to the central location of the Arab-Israeli conflict or of the Palestinian issue makes a big difference. Tunisia is not close to key regional conflicts. Tunisia, Tunisia geostrategically is not um, uh, as relevant for Middle Eastern conflicts and, and, and contestation over power geostrategically in, in, in the region. Therefore, Tunisia could be promoted on its journey to democratic, social, and economic reform for some time. But when it collided, with the strategic interest of keeping Tunisia stable, uh, stability was, was, was more important. Uh, so in, 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 in a way, it's important to keep in mind that populations in the region need to play their bets on their own incremental ways of changing their realities. And let me end on sort of a happier note than the um, five takeaways I presented to you, which is why, why I continue to believe that the Middle East deserves, uh, if not uh, an, an undivided um, um, policy attention, because I have to be a realist enough, but deserves our attention as scholars and definitely um, uh, observers and definitely policymakers working on the region, and deserves our attention as citizens of the region who wish to have a better fate, a better future. I, I believe that our societies continue to be and have always been vibrant societies. We are not looking at stagnant societies which have lost their appetite for attempting change. The last 10 years were very difficult. The region paid a huge price, a drastic price, a horrendous price in a place like Syria, in, Libya and Yemen, but I just came from, from, from Lebanon, where a very big price is being paid day in, day out by the population. I lived in Beirut for a year in 2009 and 2010, and I was the last time in Beirut in 2014, and I went back a week ago. And this has been heartbreaking for me, to see the situation on the ground, the social and economic situation. And I'm, I have come to tell my friends who kept telling me, well, but the Lebanese population is so resilient. And I said, please, I mean, this is increasingly sounding like a racist argument. Why are you assuming that they are resilient? They are suffering. There is no energy. 
it's difficult to, 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 I mean, you get out of the airport and it's a dark city. Y you, see, you see misery, you see growing signs of uh, an embattled uh, uh, population. And in Lebanon, the population is paying the price not only of domestic uh, uh, problems, of regional, it's paying a regional price. Lebanon is paying a regional price for what has been happening in the region throughout the last years as well. So, yes, we, 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 we have been paying a heavy price in, in, in the region, but we have not lo lost our interest in change, in progress. And if you wish to see how especially young citizens in countries as diverse as Morocco, Tunisia, Lebanon, Egypt, in Syria, in Iraq, and elsewhere, in Saudi Arabia. Look at the music and movie industry, for example. If you would like to get a sense of how vibrant our social fabrics are, stay away from politics. Look at the music and movie industry. Look at, at how new ideas are being, I wouldn't say marketed to an extent only, but are being disseminated to the public space in, in, in an embattled country like Syria using social media. Syria has not, in Syria, the Syrian intelligentsia, in spite of all what has been happening in the, in the last years, has not stopped writing, has not stopped producing music, has not stopped producing art, has not stopped producing scholarly writings in Syria and in exile. And the same can be said about societies like Saudi Arabia, which were close to a great extent, not only politically, but primarily socially, economically, and normatively, that majorities in a society like Saudi Arabia were pushed out of participation. Now they are being included, not in politics, but women are being included increasingly in the private sector. The highest percentage, by the way, in 2020 and 2021 of the inclusion of women in the private sector is in Saudi Arabia, not in the UAE, not in Qatar, not in Egypt, it's in Saudi Arabia. Look at the improvements in the family code, in gender equality, in extending rights to women. You can always say, but here is an autocrat uh, and an autocratic government extending them, but fine. Democratic governments could not protect them in Tunisia. And in Egypt, in the two years, we were seeing a dwindling gen gender equality between 2011 and 2013. So, to end on a, on, a, on a more positive note, I believe that our dynamism, and it's not only a dynamism related to how young our societies are, and we are looking at young societies, clear majorities are under the age of 25, in a place like Jordan, over 60%. Clear majorities are young, these, but not only because of that are our social fabrics dynamic. They are vibrant, but their vibrant and dynamic nature has attempted to channel its energy into politics and failed. I believe we will be looking away from politics for some time to come. That majorities are more not politically resigned, disenchanted, and are only demanding that governments become responsive at the social and economic level, and with regard to their key civil rights. But demands for wholesale democratic change, democratic reform will not be heard in the region once again. Because whatever happened in the last 10 years, in fact, led to mass disenchantment with the very idea of democracy. And when you, and here I will finish, when you bring that together with the fact that democracies are facing an existential crisis elsewhere. Here in Europe, in the US, the rise of right-wing populism, the different crises the liberal democratic order is facing, I believe the appeal of liberal democracy as a model has been shrinking in recent years. And this has not gone missed on Arab majorities in the Middle East and North Africa. Let me stop here. Thank you so much for your attention.
Right. No, I mean, this is um, a great question, Petra. Um, I, I, I completely agree. If you move away from political parties, from established uh, civil society organizations, and look at what's being debated uh, in universities, in different sectors uh, in society, including the um, art scene, you will definitely find um, uh, not only beginnings, but established ideas about democracy and rule of law and freedom of expression and freedom of association. The trouble is that for a political scientist, for these democratic beginnings or um, democratic discussions or debates to impact politics, I mean, the one carrier we know in political science, and sometimes we're very rigid in what we look at, the one carrier we would always sort of look for are formalized political actors, political parties primarily. And then you try to see, and, and therefore even in Europe, I mean, this is the very tradition of mass political parties in Europe, which were historically created within um, the working class or within other social uh, groups with a set of cultural, uh, social, and political preferences. And these groups gave birth to political parties which continue to operate. I mean, now, of course, established political parties are seeing their role and significance being undermined due to, to the rise of populist parties, but even populist parties can claim some affiliation to social groups. You, you have a formalization in, 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 in uh, Europe, for example, or in the U.S., of social and political movements into political parties or party platforms or um, uh, platforms which run candidates and elections. We have not been having this translation of the democratic energy of the social fabric into formal politics. And I keep saying, and even so when I used to work with my students at Stanford and I would say, I would ask them, so I used to teach comparative government and I would have the Middle East only as one region among different regions where I was teaching be it popular mobilization and democratic breakthroughs as we discussed yesterday or um, the emergence of modern trade unions and political parties. And so and I would always say when you come to the Middle East, you will find one anachronistic sector in Middle Eastern societies, and that is politics. Politics is anachronistic. When you compare politics to realities unfolding elsewhere, it doesn't make sense. I mean, this is an outdated form. This is an outdated reality. But it, but it still is the central reality. And we saw it, and we saw it at a very high cost after 2011, because when the Pandora's box was open in a place like Tunisia, which political parties were quick to form and formalize? Religious-based? Radical? Not right of center? right of center or left of center, but sort of far right and far far left, or ideological groups in general. So it seemed that when the Pandora's box in Tunisia of formal politics was opened up, it was not an invitation for uh, pragmatic, uh, democratic oriented or spirited groups connected to the masses, to, to social groups to formalize and, and, and form political parties. It was an invitation for religious groups and ideological movements to formalize. When the Pandora's box of Egyptian politics was pushed open after 2011, that's exactly what happened. And I, can, I, I attempted to establish a political party, a liberal political party in Egypt after 2011. We established it at the end of the day, but it took us over a year and a half Whereas religious groups were establishing their parties day in, day out. They had their constituents already. They had their social and political capital. They had the use of religious spaces and the translation of religious capital into political capital. This was um, a, different, a different reality that we were waking up to. But not only that. So because you ask about democracy and society and why it gets lost before entering into... Um, formal politics. I believe the, the lack of formalization of democratically spirited groups in political uh, parties is one response. The second response is the fact that for most, because politics has been, as a sphere, has been discredited in popular reading for so long. This is a legacy of undemocratic realities in the post-independence era. 
I mean, the creation of the post-independence state in, 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 in the region was not a democratic creation. In, in most cases, I mean, Lebanon was a big exception before the civil war. Um, an exception where um, a form of pluralism, consociational uh, democracy, or you, you, you label it the way you want, but Lebanon was the one exception of pluralist dynamics in formal politics. Elsewhere, formal politics were controlled by one actor. I mean, that actor was a one party, or that actor was a strong institution, or that actor was a royal family. And in a way, in the popular reading, formal politics as a sphere was discredited. So I can, I can narrate a lot about when, when 2011 happened in Egypt and the, un, uh, the democratic nonviolent uprising was populated by young Egyptians, middle class Egyptians. When the first objective of removing former President Mubarak was reached, most of them were not interested in participating in politics. And you know what they kept saying? This is not the, a game that we would like to play. This is not the sphere we would like to penetrate. And of course, you can always say here are idealistic activists uh, shying away from the difficulties of participating in formal politics, but it was more than that. It's the discredited sphere itself and the popular disenchantment surrounding it. So yes, we have this disparity between a social fabric where you find a lot of interesting debates and discussions, even, by the way, discussions about religion. I'm, I'm, when I said that we haven't settled the score on the place of religion in society, it's once again because politics has not yielded significant constitutional, legal, or political results to figure out the place of religion in society. It does not mean that society is not debating in its movements, in its different groups, organizations, what to do. There are debates, and, and, and if you look at the Arabic language literature uh, on democracy, on questions of secularism, on uh, and I'm, 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 I'm here in a place, and I'm not sure yeah, whether Nasr Hamad Abu Zaid, Rabbana Arhamu, taught here, applied or not. I mean, this is a great name, Rabbana Arhamu, who worked a lot on figuring out how to modernize our understanding of religion, how to find a place for religion in society which does not obstruct the emergence of uh, a legal framework that protects your rights and mine, that provides for gen gender equality, and so on and so forth. That, that, that is what's at stake. Thank you so much. This is um, um, uh, a great question and, 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 and an opportunity for me to correct um, to correct an, an impression which I did not mean to invoke. I, I personally continue to believe in the value of liberal democracy. I mean, this is my personal, intellectual, and political choice. But I do not believe that this is the only answer in the region, and I happen to believe, and, and John, you were saying uh, that my last remark about the movement away from politics uh, needs to be discussed, and I completely agree, but this is part of the answer I'm uh, seeing the region delivering. No, I mean, it's not, it's not about only liberal democracy as a one model uh, forward, and, and there are two interesting uh, 
signs which which need to be um, uh, to be looked at. One of them is related to what's on uh, our collective minds um, in many places uh, for different purposes: energy crisis here, food crisis there. But the Russian war on Ukraine. It's interesting. The Arab Barometer ran different surveys on how Arabs, Arab citizens in different age groups in North Africa and in the Middle East look at the Russian war on Ukraine. And one of the questions posed to the uh, interviewed, surveyed, was whether they believe in, I mean, the way the Biden administration framed it as a fight between democracy and autocracy, right? I mean, this is one of the interpretations put forward. And a uh, sheer majority, it's over 70%, in most North African places and even higher in, in the Gulf, and the Arab barometer works in most Arab countries away from the places of um, uh, conflict. The sheer majority does not buy um, um, the reading of the Russian war in Ukraine as a global fight between democracies and autocracies. And by the way, the sheer majority does not buy the reading of um, uh, being against Russia in the war on Ukraine um, because as many Western governments are saying that they are against the um, uh, uh, annexation of land, of territory, of foreign countries based on uh, military aggression. The second point is very much related to the fact of the hypocrisy we see in relation to Israel and the occupied territories since 1967, where annexation of territory has been accepted and um, uh, ignored for a very long time. But away from that, no, majorities do not buy the distinction or the reading of democracies and autocracies and fight. I believe that the liberal democratic model was very appealing, according, once again, not to my opinion, but to public opinion surveys, appealing to clear majorities in many Arab countries in 2010, 2011, 2012, and it's been losing its appeal in recent years. When you look at the Arab barometer and the survey once again, the first political demand, I mean the, the number one, number two, number three, and four demands are all social and economic. But the first political demand is not a demand for free elections, it's not a demand for rule of law, it's a demand uh, for accountability because there is a perceived corruption, there is perceived endemic corruption, which citizens perceive everywhere. So they do not demand um, uh, fair and free elections or a rotation of power or rule of law in broad terms. They demand accountability. So to your question, no, I, I believe that the region with its dynamic social fabrics might respond to the question of polity, how to structure polity in a way which makes it responsive to citizens and their needs which makes it responsive to rights and freedoms, which makes it responsive to uh, the demand on security because, once again, I mean, majorities are not only demanding uh, reform and more rights and freedoms, they are also demanding uh, security. And I remember because I saw uh, and I experienced it firsthand, I was, I was in Egypt and was active in the public space, how the set of popular demands for a majority of Egyptians was shifting from being geared towards fair and free uh, democratic election, pluralist elections, and uh, uh, democratic constitution, even if we were fighting over religion, and so on and so forth, to demanding security and stability uh, and improvement in their living conditions, because they were seeing all three factors deteriorate on the ground. I mean, the democracy dividend, the price. Uh, any society would pay was not for, for a democratic transition was not accounted for. No, liberal democracy is not the only answer, and I believe it's becoming less popular in the region as it used to be at the beginning of the decade. It has lost a great deal of its appeal, and one of the ways of understanding why Arab governments and Arab majorities are l reluctant to, to buy into this reading of the Russian war on Ukraine being a fight between democracies and autocracies is the fact that they are questioning themselves whether democracy, liberal democracy is the answer to what, what they suffer from or whether maybe a different model, a Chinese model or um, a, a different model, I mean, maybe a Saudi model or whatever model. I'm, I'm just throwing um, um, uh, 
I have reservations regarding each one of them, of course, uh, but uh, it's not, it's not no longer the case that liberal democracy is an uncontested uh, model for uh, polities and societies in the region. So I completely agree. And I'm not sure in what way did you risk uh, the threatening uh, uh, views of the Dutch government in your question. Does the Dutch government believe that liberal democracy is the only answer? I'm asking you. <laughs> no, no answer. <laughs> They say, I mean, the, the new Article 2 does refer to the principles of Sharia and principles of other religions in plural. So it's a different trip. Hmm? Yes, in the second article. It's been slightly changed. But, but, but yes, it's been slightly changed. But your Great, I mean, sure, no, I mean, great question. So, f first of all, to, to, to contextualize a bit the appointment of, um, his name escapes me, of, um, hmm? yeah, maybe, of, of, of the judge um, uh, who presides over the Supreme Constitution and Court in Egypt, to contextualize his appointment a bit, the Can government has been pushing for the appointment of Copts and women as judges in, in uh, in recent years, Bauke and I were discussing the legal amendment, which was introduced in Egypt, if I'm not mistaken, less than two years ago, opening, opening the way for appointing female judges, not only in the administrative court system, but in, 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 in uh, regular courts, as well as in the constitutional branch of the judiciary. I mean, as you know, the Egyptian judiciary is structured in a French way around three branches, administrative, citizens, uh, administrative way where you take the government to court, and then the sort of normal courts for citizens, and then the constitutional branch. So the government has been pushing forward, and this is not out of context region, that sometimes you find governments which push forward sort of modernizing um, uh, elements in, 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 in the formation of the state apparatus or branches of government, similar to what's happening to an extent in Saudi Arabia, uh, in Egypt, in the UAE, and elsewhere, this opening for women and for non-Muslims. This is the wider context. I believe the fact that the, a supreme, um, the Supreme Constitutional Court is presided um, um, over by a Coptic judge does not represent a difficulty in interpreting the second article on the principles of Sharia as the source of legislation. Um, Coptic and Muslim judges are trained exactly the same way. Uh, secondly, there is a bu huge body of literature. The Supreme Constitution Court was established in 1980, and it has looked once and again at Article 2 in its past uh, articulation as the prime source of legislation, or in the current articulation where the reference is to uh, Sharia and other religions, uh, it has been looking at it and the compatibility of um, uh, different uh, pieces of legislation with Article uh, 2. So there is a body of literature which he will depend on. Um, thirdly, and uh, I have been reading a bit um, about the Supreme Constitution Court and the way the decision making process in it. I mean, this is not a, a one man show. This is a true deliberation based, like in most Supreme Constitutional Courts and most Constitutional Courts. Uh, you have majority opinions and minority opinions, or you have a majority and um, uh, uh, a 
uh, deviating uh, opinions. So these procedures allow for a wider account of any case which will be looked at. So I don't, I don't see it as, as problematic. In fact, I saw it as a sign of progress, of attempting to deliver on, at least in one way, on the fact that your religious identity does not matter as far as the operation of the state apparatus and its inner workings are concerned. So a judge is a judge, be it a Muslim or a Christian. A prime minister should be a prime minister, no matter Muslim or Christian, man or woman. So it's a step which goes in the right direction. To my mind, I was very pleased. Thank you, Mark. Well, social media is, uh, has come to be a key sphere for contestation uh, between different um, uh, groups, different um, uh, opinions, different ideologies, but it's not a sphere which has um, uh, a clear ideological preference. No, you find, I mean, as you find it here, in the Netherlands or in any Western society, social media is a space for contestation. So um, uh, organized groups uh, express their opinions, individuals express their opinions. There is not um, uh, an ideological, overall ideological preference, uh, pro-democracy. No, I mean, there are many sites many accounts which are reactionary to my mind, I'm using my labels, regressive, uh, outdated, anachronistic, uh, extremist, problematic, and so on and so forth. I mean, so, um, no, social media is not an alternative. Social media has created um, a, a momentum of dynamism with regard to freedom of expression. What we used to have before was, um, to an extent, full controlled in some countries or semi-controlled in other countries, media landscapes, traditional media landscapes, some of which were open to alternative views and ideas. Egypt, prior to 2011, had a bit of freedom. Tunisia had a bit of freedom in the media landscape, but definitely the inception, emergence of the significance of social media created more of a pluralist and dynamic uh, space. It did create as well, secondly, so it created more dynamism. It leveled the playing field. Uh, in a way, it was no longer up to me or up to you if we were um, uh, representatives of power, be it that power is political or that power is religious or traditional, the patriarchy, the religious establishment or the government. It was no longer up to any one of these authorities to silence my voice if I was out of uh, um, um, grace with the three of them, I could still find a way to express my opinion. So it increased dynamism and leveled the playing field, uh, enabling more actors to express their views and ideas. But by no means has it been sort of unilateral in its ideological direction or make in the sense of promoting uh, greater freedom. Some use social media to argue against freedom. Some use social media not to promote and foster equality, but to undermine equality, be gender equality or equality across religious groups and identities. So it's, it's, a, it's a tool, it's a space, it has its own uh, realities. It's an interesting space to look at. It's open to more groups than traditional media landscapes, but I wouldn't put any ideological layer or preference on, and definitely does not replace. And I believe as, as unpopular political parties may be, and maybe it's my bias, it's probably my bias as a political scientist. I continue to believe that the only way to participate in politics is by means of political parties. Civil society organizations are not a replacement. 
trade unions are not a replacement. Uh, groups of debating uh, clubs and debating intellectuals uh, are not a replacement. You need formalized political parties to participate in politics, even in semi-authoritarian, semi-democratic settings. You still need political parties. But once again, you have to address the structural deficiencies which I was referring to. And uh, we have a great party in Egypt with a great liberal legacy, El Waft, going all the way back to pre-independence uh, time. A, a name that still resonates with the majority of Egyptians. But this party has been squandered in terms of institutional capabilities, constituency building activities due to decaying leadership. A leadership which was in office longer than former President Mubarak. In fact, in total. Thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, a set of um, um, very um, uh, interesting reflections and two, two great questions. So on, on the first question, yes, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I mean, if we, if we um, agree on incremental, on, on the uh, primacy of incremental reform as opposed to sudden change or radical change, because once again, since our social fabrics have been surprising us to an uh, unbelievable extent in, in the last 10 years with a degree of uh, dilemmas, uh, conflicts, potential for violence that we were seeing unfolding in many countries. And not only in, 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 in Libya, Syria, and Yemen, where the state is integrating, but elsewhere too, the social fabrics have been surprising us with a great deal of potential for violence and conflict and uh, un, un, um, and the inability to, to make consensus, to, to create consensus in society. So yes, so incremental reform is not only a reform of political parties, uh, civil society spheres, or media landscapes. No, it really begins with the educational um, uh, sector. And I, I, I went back recently because I, 
intellectually, I'm, I truly am going back to, to the question on liberal democracy. I truly am in a moment where I'm questioning whether liberal democracy is the right response or not, or whether we have to broaden our horizon and look for alternative ways of moving forward or how to inject the dynamism of, of society, which I was referring to in music and movie industry. And by the way, I just a few days ago, I watched a great Lebanese movie uh, by the name of Costa Brava Lebanon. Maybe you watched it. It's on Netflix. Uh, and it's an, it's an excellent and dystopian uh, sort of movie, but an excellent treatment of the events of, of recent years. So, so I'm in a moment where I'm intellectually questioning um, uh, liberal democracy as a model. I continue to believe that it's good to extend rights and enfranchise and not to disenfranchise and protect uh, rights and freedoms, but it's, I'm not so sure about it. So yes, so if you take incremental reform seriously, education is a key place where you have to start to. It's in families and in education, our households and our education. I mean, the, the, the creation of um, uh, or the, the, the popularity of undemocratic uh, preferences in the sense of not preferring equality, not preferring um, uh, extending the same rights to all. It really begins in the educational system and in our households, and addressing them has to take us back to, to both of them. Interestingly enough, not only because you are the ambassador of Lebanon, but Lebanon was the one country up until mid-1990s with the best rated educational system in the region, schools and universities. And of course, when you look at not only the legacy of the American University in Beirut, which shaped, and um, uh, Petra, you were asking about debates and ideas. I mean, this one location, the American University in Beirut, shaped modern discussions in Arabic language about pan-Arabism, nationalism, democracy, human rights, more than anywhere else. I mean, this is a great place, a great intellectual uh, spot. But Lebanon, up until mid-1990s had the best rated educational sector in the region and, and look where it is right now. So in a way, we are not beginning where we were in the 1990s, we're really beginning from far away. It's not only sustaining what we have, it's rebuilding what, what went lost uh, in the educational sector and it's rebuilding capacities in universities, public and private universities and I have to take note of the fact that we do have a growing disparity in the Arab world between the Gulf and between the oil exporting uh, part of the Arab world and the non-oil exporting part of the Arab world. If you are looking for solid, even to an extent tolerant, uh, open educational systems, the UEE and increasingly a place like um, uh, Oman, uh, Qatar, uh, maybe increasingly Saudi Arabia, are more of the places where you would go. So it's now the opposite migration. Gulf students used to go to the AUB to take their uh, undergrad and graduate studies. Now it's the other way around. Even Egyptian students and Lebanese students are going to the Gulf, to American outposts, to, um, to, to American universities in the Gulf and elsewhere. So it's, but definitely education is a big issue. And, and, and I, I, I mean, for anyone who is interested, I recommend a recent report which was released by the ESQA, um, the United Nations uh, Development a uh, Agency for uh, West Asia um, on education in the Arab world was just released. The second question on um, uh, external actors and um, the uprisings, the first wave and the second wave, there were, there were cases where I couldn't but agree with what you've said. The intervention in Libya uh, was a case in point. In, uh, and I'm referring to the military intervention, which unfortunately was sanctioned by the Arab uh, League back then uh, as well. And, and, and it created um, dynamics and realities on the ground, which later on, to put it very diplomatically, led Libya away from any uh, path toward uh, greater uh, uh, human rights and greater inclusion uh, and stability. And unfortunately, the lesson of Afghanistan, of Libya, of Iraq, uh, of the, the horrible outcome of military interventions, 
by Western countries, be it the references to the U.S. or the U.S. and a group of Western countries, seems to um, have not been taken seriously up until today. I, 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 um, I believe that the intervention in Libya was, um, uh, in terms of its outcome, its details, uh, catastrophic. Elsewhere, the appeal of external actors was an appeal was to a, to a great extent an appeal made by some political actors on the ground which expected um, the, the international community to be in favor of its role and its promotion. And I'm referring to the religious uh, groups um, to a great extent. Um, and, and this appeal was misleading and, and in a way did not did not help in terms of steering to, to, to a pass between gradually opening up and gradually reforming while keeping the integrity and the integration of the nation state as well. So um, my, my, my takeaway reflecting on, on the region after 10 years is that we are better off believing in incremental reform and we are better off believing in the value of homegrown, domestic-driven reform with as little intervention in politics from outside as possible. And I'm even including oppositions and so-called opposition movements abroad, which I do not believe in. I believe our political histories are histories for politics from within, not from without, unlike some other countries. And this is nothing against them and nothing against us. It's how I read our political history. Thank you. Well, well I, I, I'm not sure about what pattern of regional cooperation we, 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 we're talking, because if you are referring to government-to-government -to -government cooperation with regard to energy issues, for example, this is progressing and progressing in an interesting way, which to my mind need, needs and should be promoted. Uh, not, not looking at the region in an exclusive manner, the region against anyone else, but the region with everyone else. But it's happening. If you're looking at regional integration at the level of sort of um, groups of young citizens, activist groups collaborating regionally, that has been happening as well and in very difficult conditions. Uh, but once again, I mean, I, I um, look at some publication platforms, Arabic language public publication platforms out of Beirut, out of Cairo, uh, out of um, uh, Casablanca and Rabat, and I see the names and the affiliations and countries of those participating in writing and in debating quite cross-Arab and cross-regional. Uh, um, if, you, if you mean cooperation between political actors, no, this has not happened. Um, away from some collaboration between governments, but once again, political actors on the ground have been sort of, to a great extent, struggling with their own structural deficiencies and deficits. I remember in 2012 going once again to, to Beirut for the establishment of a liberal alliance of Arab uh, political parties, and it was established in Beirut in 2012. And we were hopeful back then, and we were pushing forward sort of um, uh, the idea of Dawla al madaniyya the state civil in nature, uh, the secular state, secular legal frameworks, equal rights for women and men. And the meeting was great, but there was no follow-up. 
uh, because everyone was distracted with what was happening on, on the ground. But there is a liberal alliance of, uh, with a fancy name uh, of political parties in the region. I believe it still exists and has a secretariat uh, somewhere. So um, it depends on which sector we're looking at. But what's interesting to go back to the educational question is to see sort of, I was very impressed, I mean, coming to, to the Netherlands and then later to, to Germany as a graduate student, I was very impressed by how European students were moving between different European universities, picking up courses here and there, the Erasmus uh, program. I believe emulating some of these models in the educational sector, in schools, maybe high schools, as well as in universities would be great to incentivize uh, collaboration. Social media is a great pan-Arab space, by the way, just to close off. There you, you find, I mean, just take as an example, I mean, the um, uh, Moroccan team in the World Cup and the level of debating which unfolded in social media in Arabic language around the participation and the victories uh, of the Moroccan team in the World Cup. So social media is a true pan-Arab space as well, and the language as a carrier is hugely important. So it's quite a diverse picture.
Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Let me, let me, let me just say um, very briefly, um, uh, and I'm, I'm conscious of the time. Um, on, on, on the one hand, I, I couldn't but agree with your reference to the sentiment among citizens in, in the Arab world who are demanding an improvement in their living conditions. Uh, and you, you name the key sectors in any society, right? Education, healthcare, social safety nets. I mean, 